everybody. Scott Holstein here with CompuTrolls, and welcome back to the Building Technology Podcast. Today, I'm joined by our guest, Gip Erskine. Gip knows the life of a property manager is stress-filled, which is why he's committed to designing and living the ideal life for himself, his colleagues, and the service partners who serve him. Gip founded Eversmarts in 2013 as an informative, inspirational platform to share universal truths and experiences with the property management community. From the service partner's perspective, he provides powerful insights for company owners and business developers in related industries. He teaches salespeople to speak their customers' language so they can win the right business together. He is on a mission to change the way service partners sell and property managers buy. Gip is certified as a values trainer by the Demartini Institute and a certified instructor for both BOMA and Texas Real Estate Commission. He holds CPM and CCIM designations, as well as a Texas real estate salesperson's license, is a lifetime member of Texas Real Estate Teachers Association, and earned his MBA at Baylor University. An avid yachtsman and father of two daughters, Gip lives in Dallas, Texas, with his beautiful soulmate, Brenda, who are living examples of how to live full lives. He is passionate about sharing ideas on how you can create an exceptional career and an exceptional life. I love that bio, Gip. Welcome to the podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me, Scott. So, uh, you know, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile ahead of this conversation, and, uh, you know, you are you, you have a very unique background in that you have been on the service partner side as well as the, the buyer side of things. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. Obviously, we touched on some things there in the bio, but tell us a little bit more about uh, where, you know, where you kind of went in your career and what you're doing today. Well, I appreciate that. I, uh, um, up until the turn of the century, I had a kind of a traditional commercial property management career. I started back in 1984 and really haven't turned that, that piece off. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, go to work for the Staubach company. If you are old enough to remember Roger Staubach, one of the Dallas Cowboys premier quarterbacks, <laughs> um, he uh, there was an opening to join his firm as a uh, vice president of business development. And I, I, I wasn't applying for that particular job, but I got slated for it. And I went in kicking and screaming. I said, you know, you, you've got the wrong guy. I'm a, I'm a management guy. And they said, no, that's exactly why we want you is because you can understand the operational problems and communicate that to, you know, to our clients. And so that's exactly why we want you. And so once I got over that little lump of, of reality, I went headlong into business development. And so for about a dozen years, I was um, selling facility services and um, through various different partnerships and, and really learning the, the sales side of things where traditionally on the property management side, I'm on the buyer side. So I have an appreciation for both, both the, 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 sales, uh, the sales industry and those mechanisms, as well as um, the, the, uh, the buying side from, from a property management. So I did, I did recently, I did some math, um, uh, went back through, through my 36 plus year career and determined that I had managed over $5 billion worth of commercial real estate and negotiated uh, an estimate, albeit uh, over a hundred million dollars in, in service contracts. So I've got I've got a fairly deep pedigree with, with respect to just experience on the uh, on the commercial side. Um, on the kind of the personal development side, I've been a a personal development. Um, I used to call myself a junkie, but uh, that's a sounds a little bit dependent. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I was I'm a major consumer of of that, and you and I spoke about your appetite for for you know really profound truths, and and so I've always been been um, engaged in understanding uh, universal truths, and and um, interestingly have gotten uh, immersed into the study of human values, and so from a from a values perspective. Um, I'm very interested in how the actual sales uh, process works and have evaluated both on the service partner side and their attempt to sell to us 
and on the property management side and our ability to buy services. And I notice a big gap in, in uh, just general valuation. So I made it a mission to go into, I mean, and this, is a, this is a big process. I mean, this is, this is something that's been going on and will continue to go on until, you know, until we're, we're dust on this earth. But, but um, I've noticed that, that unless, unless true values and true needs are determined, there isn't a sale. There is no transaction ever. So that was a profound truth that's kind of everlasting. Unless I have a need for your service, I'm not ever going to buy it. And so the conveyance of those needs became uh, kind of tantamount to, to that particular process. So for the past several years, I've gone into how is it that service partners sell and, and how is it that, that property managers buy? And so, so that's been my study you know, for, for several years, and I'm just intrigued about how uh, we can actually change it, strengthen that particular process for both sides so that uh, both parties get, uh, get a win-win out of it. Yeah, and uh, I think, you know, what, what you talked about, how you really started on the property management side, went into the business development side, selling to property managers, and, and now kind of do a little bit of both. Um, you, you know, you're helping property managers buy, you're helping, um, helping service partners sell. Um, I think that that is a, that, that's something that everybody could really use. And unfortunately, not a lot of people get that type of experience. I can tell you from my own background, um, pre computrols I was doing sales for a marketing agency. Now, prior to that, I had never been a, you know, a buyer of marketing services. Um, so for me, I was, you know, I was selling, selling blind to some extent. I was doing my best to put myself in the shoes of the people who were buying from me. Um, but frankly, just, it was a guess. Um, so, you know, I, I can imagine now having been, you know, on the, on the consumer side of marketing, um, for the last five years, uh, if I went back to resell this product, I would do it much differently than I would have before because I have that perspective now um, and can speak to a lot of those, um, not just pain points, but, uh, you know, understand what drives those decisions and, uh, and help people um, through the sales process. Uh, because as a, someone beginning, um, you know, in a more of a buyer type role, um, it was, there, there were hurdles to overcome for me because I was, thinking, okay, well, how do I evaluate this? You know, I'm trying to break this down. I need to get pricing from at least three different people here. And, uh, and that's really, you know, kind of what we want to talk about today is, uh, is how do you select the service partner? So for, you know, for our property managers and facility managers that are listening, um, you know, what are those, how do you, how do you find a, a good service partner through all of the noise? And, uh, and I'm part of that noise. So, <laughs> I have a, a unique appreciation for the noise, I guess. And, uh, and honestly, for the service partner side of things, um, I think a lot of service partners who listen to this are going to be um, intrigued to hear what you have to say about, you know, how do I, how do I break through? How do I, how do I get my foot in the door? How do I differentiate myself from everybody else here? Um, and, you know, one of the things, you know, we, we use this word service partner and we use, you know, you, you kind of started using it right off the bat. Um, that was a word that I, I had learned from a property manager. Um, they said, no, we don't call our vendors vendors um, because it's different. And, you know, it, can you talk a little bit about the, the difference between what you would consider a service partner and a vendor, even though they're kind of synonymous? Yeah, there's a lot, lot there to, to unpack. I will start by saying now that we're in 2021, I can say that that perspective is, is you know, like hindsight, it's 2020. And that was pun intended, um, but, but I do think I do think that uh, you indicated, you know, just how we position those those who serve us and those we serve. And um, interestingly, we uh, we we look at virtually everybody that we interact with as a customer. And if you look at it that way, even the people who are providing service to you, if you treat them as a customer, what is it? That's that you're beholden to them if they give you a service. Well, you're required to pay them and compensate them in fair exchange. 
um, um, in exchange for the duties and services that they've rendered. So, so if you treat them uh, with, a, you know, a, as a customer, as somebody who would like fair and prompt payment um, uh, in consideration for the services rendered, then then that's the very basic uh, um, foundation of a partnership. If you look at vendors, uh, vendors sounds like they are interchangeable cogs in a in a wheel. You can you can go to a vendor list and just you know pick three. It doesn't matter who they are, what experience they've got, what um, investments they've made in their own in their own uh, culture. Um, none of that matters because when you're at the vendor level and you're just looking for the lowest price widget, that's what a vendor does. It fulfills kind of like an office supply. You really don't care how cool that stapler is and what the philosophy was when you right. came to buy the stapler. You just want a good stapler. And uh, it becomes interchangeable. When you look at service partnerships and the actual word partner, it means it's a dual, it's a dual party. It's, it's, it's a reliance on the other for, um, for deepening a relationship, for really understanding what, as I said before, what the needs are and, and uncovering the pain and then, and then, you know, expanding what the potential solutions could look like beyond what we just think they might be at the onset. So, so it's a real give and take of exchanging information that, that makes a partnership work. And so I got really, really, uh, um, enthralled by the idea of, well, who is, who are the, the primary service partners that, that I could really focus on? And I, I just went to who are the highest, the highest cost, uh, line items. And it turns out that they're janitorial and security from an ongoing service standpoint. So I really focused in on, on those particular industries and, and really understanding that if we are going to market on a low bid wins basis only, we are really overlooking all of the, the non-monetary, the subjective uh, uh, attributes of a company and just looking at them to sharpen their pencil. And, and I find that in, in hindsight, I find it absolutely ludicrous that, that we've just completely thrown out any investments, any any um, true values that they put into their company and we've just boiled it down to a particular number. And so I think when you look at partnerships that way, it, it's, a, it's a real understanding from the buyer side. I wanna understand how valuable this service partner is to my properties, for my tenants, for my clients. What value can they can they give me in a fair exchange for the payment that I give them so I get the most cost effective and not just the cheapest. So I think that's the, that's a good differentiation between the two. Yeah. And I do want to get into, you know, I do want to get into the differentiators um, beyond, you know, like you said, just the price. I mean, price is always going to remain a factor, um, but uh, we will get into that. Um, but kind of from my perspective, I always think of things in a process and certainly in the sales process, you know, I'm always looking to, you know, get my foot in the door. Now, as a building engineer, as a property manager, um, as a building operator, as somebody who is, um, you know, in the looking out for the best interest of their facilities and, uh, and evaluating new partners, uh, I know that you know people. People are cold calling. People are sending you, you know, direct mail. They're they're emailing you. Um, you're getting referrals. Um, what do you think is the best way to determine who to let in the door uh, to have that initial conversation? Because we all know time is your most valuable asset. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's a, it is a really really good question, and it's one that I have been asked. Uh, countless times, you know, how do I just break in with you guys, with your company, and and you know, how do I, how do I earn uh, your business? And and I think it's in that um, that earning that will differentiate them. 
So if you, if you take a cold email, for example, that is purely a numbers game. It's somebody who bought a list or acquired a list of names from somewhere and blasted out a shotgun approach to, to the market in the hopes that they can get you know, some type of a return on that particular investment or invited to bid on X, Y, and Z business. But they don't care who that company is so long as they get a sale. And so um, unless it's a highly researched um, uh, email that will not be cold, it will be a warm email, there'll be somebody who actually looked me up on LinkedIn and said, I noticed this. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Anybody can look me up on LinkedIn. Um, but I also noticed that and that this particular solution might fulfill that particular need. I'm like, oh, okay, this person has actually put some thought into this without just slapping a, a you know, um, something that can, can be easily found on Google into the, into the, uh, uh, into the email, because that could still be somewhat mass customized, if you will. Right. So, so who are those people that we let in? It's those people that have, have earned a right. Um, I did get a recent, a recent call uh, from a, a, a roofing company, and um, they had a motto. I can't remember the exact motto, but but it was something that suggested, you know, that's why we're different. And, and I said, you know what, I will take this call because I want to understand what makes them different. And, and by different, I would infer that that would mean better and better than the competition. Right. I'm happy to, to, to take that call. And uh, so I did 20 minutes in and I said, guys, I haven't heard what makes you better. So let me just remind you what your motto says. You said, you know, <laughs> that you were, you were different and that to me means better. Tell me what that means to, to you. Right. And they couldn't answer the question. And it wow. was, it, so it was a hollow motto and they, they tried to wrap up the call. They said, oh, can we come out and survey your properties? I said, no, you, you, you really didn't fulfill what you were, you know, uh, proclaiming that you could because you, you couldn't answer the question even after I teed it up for you. So, so I do look for, for, for those companies who have recognized a particular, um, uh, a, maybe not a need, but, but, but something that says, here's why we're different, please allow us to explain, versus those who were like, the next time you go out for bidding landscaping, please keep us in mind. I mean, I don't know why I should. Right because you've just reminded me that I need to go out to bid landscaping. Um, uh, or please give me five minutes of your time so I can explain our company to you. And right off the bat, they've undersold themselves by pleading for five minutes of, of my time. I'm like, holy crow, I, you know, please value yourself higher than that right. and, and allow me to dictate the amount of time that I, I want to invest in the particular meeting without short selling yourself. And so some of these tactics uh, appear to be desperate, appear to be, you know, either numbers driven uh, or otherwise, but it's those who have uh, the bravery and, and the respect for the, for the party that they're uh, calling upon that can actually do some digging, figure out the properties that I'm responsible for and ask some, some, some folks visit the properties. If, if you want to go so far, look at the directory and say, oh, I realize you have, you know, P&G is your largest tenant in, in your building. You know, they must be a handful. We actually service some of their accounts. Can we, you know, can we talk about some synergies? Wow. Yes. <laughs> Come on in. Yeah, they are. And so I use that as a, as an example. They're actually not a tenant of mine, but, but it's, it's someone who has actually put two and two together that says, you know, there's, there is something there that's of value that is worth uh, looking into. I will take those calls all the time. Gotcha. So really, as, a, as an evaluator, you're looking for somebody who, who does have maybe a different approach or a unique approach to your problem. Um, and then, you know, is willing to do a little bit of due diligence on their end to better understand who they're speaking with. They're not just, like you said, the shotgun approach of, I'm gonna get this in front of 200 people, uh, and you know, based on my numbers, five people will respond, three people will set up a meeting, 
Um, and you know, that's, you know, that's, that is, you know, I, I've seen that sales approach and, um, it's not ineffective, but like you said, what you end up with is, you know, you're not necessarily able to, uh, find partners who are going to differentiate themselves. Now, um, you know, again, I, I always go back to the salesperson side of things. I think of, you know, the sales process of discovery, demonstration, due diligence, proposal, et cetera. Um, but from an evaluation standpoint, do you have a process for evaluating those service partners? Well, the reason why I think that the sales process is flawed on both sides is it's not just the service partner's uh, failed attempt at, at trying to get my attention, getting on the bid list and, and uh, winning business that way. It's very often the property manager's uh, failed attempt at recognizing value um, because sometimes those cold emails turn into a, a guilt trip reminder that said, you know what, you haven't been out landscaping in a while and I may as well just take this guy and add him to the list. Right. And that's the absolute worst thing you can do because you've, you've not done any homework on your end and you've done that cold call or the cold email or a disservice by just adding them to a, to a list that they have no idea who you even are. And so, so yes, I, I, I've seen, obviously in 36 plus years, I've seen uh, any number of, of uh, sales tactics and processes and, you know, um, can we get together? Are you free at Tuesday at 10 or Thursday at two? That kind of thing. Uh, I've seen the spin close. I've been, I've been coached and trained on it. And so I, I, I recognize a lot of them um, from the property management side and facility management side, um, very, very similar roles. We, um, I, I look at things differently. I, I evaluate companies, um, uh, well beyond price, as I alluded to before, I look for for where is the hidden value? Um, where what is this company's pedigree? How did they become so successful? Can I talk to my to my colleagues and get good thumbs up reviews, um, whether you told me to to ask them or not? Um, often we will go out and um, if it's a if it's a large project, um, I will go out with my circle of, of property managers and just say, you know, we're getting ready to bid this type of service out. Who, who have you guys had luck with? And are there any, any red flags out there? And sometimes I'll get candid responses and sometimes I, I won't. But uh, at least it gives me some uh, comfort as to, as to, you know, if it's a rave review, you know, boy, I. I, I love that because property managers are not very prone to to giving good reviews only because they don't want it coming back on them if right. something happened and they, they were the one that recommended them. So we're very very careful about uh, about that. But when I look at when I look at hidden value, um, I'm not just looking for what can I place a monetary value on. I'm looking for what are the things that are going to solve my problems and cure my pain. And my biggest pain is, is if I ever go out to a, you know, the, the cheapest provider out there, I know I'm going to be doing damage control. And I know I've got to do a bunch of follow-up because they're going to be spread so thin that they can't manage my account properly and responsibly. And in which case there's damage control. There is a lot of follow-up necessary and that costs me time and money. And, and if I add up all that time and money, you know what? They ended up not being the, the lowest cost. They end up being sometimes the highest cost. And so one of the things that really drive me for me is, can you be an extension of my management team? Can you be my eyes and ears and tell me what's going on beyond the scope of your contract that says, I'm a vested partner on your property. And oh, by the way, um, we just finished um, uh, cleaning your building and we noticed three lights out in the parking lot. It might be, you know, be something to, to put in there. That, you know, they didn't have to say that, but from a security standpoint, from a safety standpoint, for their own personnel safety, I would want to know that information. And thank goodness that you, you brought it to my, to my attention. Can you, can you be responsive to my needs? You know, you're not going to deliver 100% perfect work. This is 
human work, a lot of labor to it. Can you be responsive when problems come up? And they will. And so what is your built-in mechanism that ensures responsiveness? I remember going back to my Staubach days, uh, Roger was always, always very self-deprecating and he would say, you know, we're not going to deliver flawless work and there are going to be problems, but I will guarantee you that we will solve these problems faster than anybody else in the industry. And so I'm like, wow, one of the fastest problem solvers. Great. So prove to me that, that you're responsive, you can solve my problems. And, um, how are we communicating? How can I take what you're delivering for me? and equate that to value so that I can either be, be your biggest banner waiver and, and tell the tenants how awesome you are because we hired you, um, tell my clients who I report to on a, on a monthly and, and uh, quarterly and annual basis how awesome you are because the tenants love you. Um, you know, give me the equipment that actually conveys all the value throughout your, your uh, contract duration and you're, you're gonna be a partner for life. So there's a number of different, different um, factors that go into, into how I look at service partners, but very often they'll get it wrong. I've been working with, in this security industry and um, having discussions with some firms, uh, regional firms, uh, just about how they, how they come to market and, and um, invariably they will make an assumption that uh, that their, their most prized um, uh, assets are the people that work for them. And trust me, virtually every company will tell, you know, will tell us that you know, our, our people are our number one asset. That's great, that's well and good. What of those people should I care about? And they say, well, we've got, you know, the, they're all uh, veterans and have this ex-military background and they come in <clears throat> certified carrying these these type of um, uh, weapons certifications and basically come in guns blazing um, and and trying to impress upon me that they've got all these particular qualifications that are very, very um, uh, kind of a hard skill. And for me, guess what? You're not even allowed to carry a firearm on my property. So you, you, you missed it right from the get go. Right. And and, and I, I love the veterans. I'm very proud of being an American in this country. I'm not, no disrespect there, but the way they've been marketed is look how tough we are and look at what we can come equipped to, to, you know, to bring to you. And I don't care about any of that. If, and I, I turned it on their ear and I said, I said, if you really know, if you really want to know what I want, I'm looking for an answer person, somebody who is observant but approachable, who looks the part, who says, I'm a deterrent because I'm security, but I'm approachable because I'm going to have guests coming into my building. I have no idea where this tenant is. I have no idea where the closest Starbucks is. I have no idea how to get a cab to the airport. I have no idea all these different proximate resources that they should be the answer man on. And oh, by the way, they're really, really a bad asset at security but they're not wearing it on their sleeve. Right. And so it was a huge eye opener for them because they made all the assumptions of what uh, property managers and facility managers want. So that, that was pretty eye opening for them. And, and it was, you know, telling it like it is from, from my perspective. Yeah, and one of the things you brought up there, uh, which I'm curious about, uh, it sounds like that particular service partner came in, uh, like you said, guns a blazing, no pun intended. And uh, the, uh, you know, they, they just, they really started firing away at you before you could even tell them what your needs were and what was important to you. Is that a red flag for you when a, a, a potential service partner comes in without asking any questions and just starts spilling out how they're going to, how they're going to make your life better? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it may not be red, but it's definitely turning orange. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I just think it's presumptuous. Um, and, and, and I look at, I look at one of the best doctors I've had in my, in my life and somebody who, who sat down with me and, and, um, just talked to me and I said, aren't you going to examine me? I said, I am, I'm talking to you about <laughs> where it hurts, what's going on in your life. 
And then, you know, then I'll get to the examination and maybe prescribe something. But for right now, I'm examining you just by talking to you. I'm like, wow, that's brilliant. Um, how many service partners would benefit from just that simple approach? Get to know your customer, get to know about them and their properties and what it is that you'd actually like to do for them because you see a need and, or you can say that you've got a, you've got a, a solution to a particular perceived pain point. That's fine. Um, but yeah, then get to know me. Once you get to know me, then you can start to prescribe something. But um, he was training, the same doctor was, was training a, a, a med student and, and uh, she said, okay, well, based upon what I see, I'm gonna prescribe, prescribe penicillin. And he said, did you ask him if he was allergic to penicillin? Because if not, you just killed the patient. And we go, oh, okay. So there's, there's plenty of service partners out there who, <laughs> who can actually assume way too much like the guns a blazing scenario, right. um, but even on the even on the you know on the janitorial side, and I'm really focusing on those two major ones because they're the most customer facing, they're the most tenant facing, and then the, they're the highest the, the highest cost uh, on the property. But um, it's a really really hard sell to tell me that you clean better than than another company. Like your your cleaning is that much cleaner, you know? Like no, nah, I, I I I really don't think it is. It's cleaning, it's a thoroughness, I get all that, but you can't tell me you clean better than somebody else. So what else can you do? There is a point so, where clean is clean. Yeah, so then the conversation goes, you know, 20 minutes about the company and about the investment on training and cross training and here's how we do problem resolution, this and that, and we haven't talked about cleaning in the last 20 minutes. That's a conversation that I wanna have because yeah. you're not gonna change my mind if you tell me you do cleaning better. Yeah. Well, Gib, you covered a lot there in the last five minutes or so. So for our listeners, a couple of things I wanted to kind of bring back up to the forefront here. Um, you know, you had mentioned service partners bringing up things that maybe you haven't even thought of. Um, so service partners who are, you know, telling you, look, when you're evaluating um, this service, these are some things you want to keep an eye out for, you know, beyond this initial, uh, this initial engagement here's some things you want to look out for down the road. Those are service partners that you want to work with. And then um, another thing that you mentioned was references. Um, I think references are a great means of evaluating potential service partners. But if you call a reference and say, hey, I heard you work with county trolls. How do, you know, what are they like? How do they, how do, they do? Um, what you're going to get is probably this, this person is a reference for a reason. You're probably going to get uh, all, you know, all, all good things. Um, but like you said, nobody's perfect. There are going to be problems along the way. So when you call those references, don't just ask them, what do you think about CompuTrolls? Have that question in your back pocket of, tell me about a problem that you ran into with them and how they solved it. Tell me about how they communicate with you. Uh, I think that those are the things that, uh, you know, I want to make sure our listeners take away from a lot of what you just said, because like I said, you covered a lot, but those are extremely important and valuable ways to evaluate um, potential partners there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've, I've incorporated some uh, questions within the, um, uh, within the actual RFP itself is that I will ask them uh, exactly what questions do you want me to ask of your competition so that I know that I've, I've done a thorough vetting of them and you, you know, you tell me how good you are. I mean, if there are certain standards that you uphold, that's fantastic. Tell me what standards I should be mandating of your competitors. So that's number one. Um, and that tells me a lot about, you know, their qualifications. Uh, number two, and uh, what you had just talked about as far as references go, and I usually do this, yes, when, when I ask for three references, you get the three most glowing references who would just, you know, die for this company. That's great. <laughs> um, but I also ask them, give me two references of companies who you've just lost business with. And, and um, you know, if, it, if it's con you know, contentious, then I, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in really getting into, like, um, all, all of that. But I really want to understand what were the reasons that, that, that you may have lost an account. And uh, um, and hear it from them. So that gives me a little bit better 
understanding as to what um, right you know, the more accurate depiction you're not you're not going to get uh, you know you're not going to get all glowing answers so that's a that's a great idea I never 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 thought of that I've never actually been asked that either to be honest so <laughs> um, you know one of the well, things I wanted to talk to you about as well um, because you know there's a hierarchy um, within organizations when it comes to purchasing and um, one of the you know one of the challenges that um, a building engineer facility manager um, may have is okay they have they have this service partner who has come in about 10 percent higher let's say than the rest of the competitors now they have an ownership group that historically has wanted to take the lowest number um, but you know, there's there's a means of communicating that value. Can you talk a little bit about how you do that? Yeah. So, um, you know, traditionally, uh, we we go out to the market. We ask a bunch of questions. We ask for proposals, and we get big, thick uh, storybooks and uh, several sections. And when we talk about price. Uh, it's in one of the sections towards the back. And when we receive the proposals, our tendency, natural tendency, I mean, it's almost like we're wired in is to drill straight to the price. And then, well, okay, that's their price. And let's see what the other prices are. Let's whip out a spreadsheet and stack them together and say, well, here's, here's where it came out. I did my job. And that's what I have been arguing has been one of the most short-sighted uh, elements of shopping for for service partners and uh, awarding business based upon price alone. So what I've done and are continue to refine is is to assign real dollars to the non monetary attributes of of the firm. And so I'll ask pointed questions within the within the uh, within the RFP that says this is not based purely on price alone. It's based on, on how you respond to all these other questions and show, you know, demonstrate your ability to, you know, solve problems, to be, you know, have a communication standards. How do you, you know, raise your service standards? How do you solve problems? How do you innovate? All of these various different things and I assign weights to them. Once the prices come in, I do spread them like, Everybody else does, but then I have another whole section that assigns weighted values to the non-monetary attributes and reshuffles the deck and re-levels the playing field in a way that you know it's apples to apples and there are discrete values that then you can go back and, and actually see who is the most cost-effective provider based upon what you value the most. And so if your needs are my God, we're having nothing but problems, then you're putting a higher weight on problem solving and, and who is the company that's gonna outshine everybody else on that? But it's not just limited to problem solving. You need to be able to communicate how you solve those problems. You need to be able to communicate how you're preventing them from happening in the future. And so, so by putting a real dollar value on that and actually re-sorting the actual values you can demonstrate to your clients, to your manager, you, you know, to your team, uh, and even to your tenants if you need to, as to how you came up with this with this um, fact based selection. And you can also then use that. Property managers very often um, they they're very uh, they hesitate to do a lot of debriefs. And, and I think that's doing their service partners a disservice. Um, people want to know why they lost. And all we've been able to tell them is you weren't the lowest bid. And that's pretty much it. End of story, click. What we really need to, to give them back is some feedback. That if they are a quality service provider, and, and a lot of times it's like, wow, this is a service provider that you really wanted but there's, they were higher than the others. Well, if you use my method and you, and you put certain dollar values on the things that were important to you in the first place, you can demonstrate why they're the lowest and most cost-effective uh, service partner for you because the other ones are costing you money in 
time and effort and um, uh, you know solving their problems that they've given you because they're they're spread too thin to to manage their account properly. So it's a different conversation that you're having with um, with your your clients who you know they're bottom line oriented people and that's fine. On the on the property P and L, you, you're accountable. You budgeted for it. You're responsible for it. But if you can show them why another uh, another service provider can actually save money, even though the real dollars may look like it's a greater investment, it's because you put a value on those other things that actually translate into real value uh, at the end of the day. And I'll add I'll add one more thing, just to to talk about how to educate service partners about the value that they convey and some real dollars um, in 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 a large sense um, many many service partners such as copy trolls and, and and others actually say you know by installing a particular system it can actually save you know electricity wear and tear so you know it can save cost it can save you money in the long run well you would be very, very wise to know that every dollar saved um, in the operating expenses typically translates to about a 10 times the value in the value of the, of the property. So for every dollar you save me uh, per square foot, I have now in, added $10 a square foot to the value of the property. And that's, so that's, a, that's on an annual basis, right? Yes, that's on an annual basis. So, I mean, it, it works for, for any fraction. If it's 50 cents, you just save me $5. If it's, if it's $3, you save me 30, or you added $30 value to the, to, to the property. Well, that's a story that I can tell my clients that said, and here's another reason why we selected these particular uh, service partners. So, and any piece of ammunition that you can do the math on for me, or I can educate you as to what math is important to me, um, I'll give another <laughs> example of that I, I seem to always pick on on security for some for some reason, but but they will tell me, um, you know, uh, that they, they'll they'll quote me 168 hours as a contract. I'm like, what's 168 hours? It's like, well, that's 24 seven for a week. And I said, okay. <laughs> But that, that number means nothing to me. Uh, I would We're, never have put that together either. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you telling me that? And that's, but that's the way they do it. So they are kind of forcing their metric into my nomenclature. And I nah, really, I just want to tell them like, no, that's to me, it's 65 cents a foot. I deal in cost per square foot. Know my denominators because that's how I'm going to convey your value to, to the clients that hire me. So, um, yeah, there, there are uh, several opportunities where, where the actual vocabulary is just missed because of um, like just either they don't care enough to, to know or care enough to convert whatever their metric is into the sense for me. 168 hours. That is funny. Um, <laughs> you know. uh, so, you know, one of the, a couple of things, uh, again, I wanted to kind of highlight that you brought up here um, is – the importance of, of not only saying, hey, we can save you money, um, but any time as a service partner that you can say, this is how much money we can save you. If you can actually give hard numbers, obviously that's a huge help because you're making, you're making your customer's life easier in that evaluation process. And uh, you know, as, as a service partner, for you service partners out there, um, if you're not quantifying your, your you know, value in that way, and your competitors are, who do you think is going to win out there? Um, somebody who can say definitively that I can save you X number of dollars or somebody who can say, who's saying I can save you money, um, you know, because everybody's saying that. And ultimately, um, you know, you need to be able to, to prove that out to some degree. So, um, you know, Gip, we talked about the part of um, the process where you're bringing potential service partners to ownership. Um, you know, so basically we talked about going up the ladder. Now, from a property manager standpoint, you know, you have building engineers who are often the ones who are um, working with these partners on a daily basis. Um, do their opinions and, um, you know, do their uh, decisions, I guess, uh, influence 
your decisions and is that part of your process in terms of, uh, you know, that's, that's a value that you put on uh, any given quote? It, it is. And, and again, I thank you for, for asking the, the various different dimensions and the perspectives that you bring to this conversation yield uh, very interesting answers. It is in this way. Um, everyone is a customer. And so my teammates are also my customers. And so if I'm doing my job, I'm conveying what that value is to them. If they cannot do the math and do the computation or have the comfort level that says, here's, you know, on paper, it looks, it all looks great, but I hate these guys because they're arrogant and they never return my calls. Oh, <laughs> right. Well, that just gets factored into my evaluation because they're not responsive. And I've just, I've just factored in responsiveness as having a high weight on my evaluation. So thank you for that feedback. But yes, um, my, all my teammates are customers, like service partners are customers, like tenants are customers. You know, the typical customers, you'd say, yeah, yeah, they're customers. But if you look at everyone, including your team, um, it's, not, it's not my way or the highway by any stretch. You know, I don't have to live with them day in, day out. These are the guys that do. And so if their comfort is not high, um, Either I've done a poor job in relating and articulating what that value is and how it's going to be better, but um, uh, my role is not to overrule them. My role is to either convey the business case on its merits or um, understand that there are some other factors that I didn't put in the evaluation that may make somebody else shine. I'll have an example here too. Um, I did get I did get a uh, recent proposal um, from an, from an, uh, a security firm, and and the idea was that well they do they do our, our other work for us so so this will just be you know it, it, it's better because it'll all be integrated. I said that that's fine and there's probably value there too. What if you know I think this proposal was thirty thousand dollars. I said well what if what if company B comes in at $10,000? Do you have $20,000 worth of value just because of it's integrated? And what's the value of the integration? It's like, well, but it's all the same company. So it's better. I'm like, so, so what about being the same company is better? Are there certain uh, data that's shared between the two systems? I mean, they tell me, and it, I was putting the, you know, put the pressure on one of my guys that said, you got to think it through. Because just because there's an integration and it's the same company, so it must be good, you're making a pretty big assumption. So unless you can give me $20,000 worth of value, you know what? It, <laughs> it all goes into the computation. So, so I, I say that just because we have to look at it from every, every which way. We get asked questions uh, from ownership, um, sometimes out of the blue, sometimes very, very intelligent and high level. And, and we always want to come to the table prepared to support the business case. But uh, yes, to answer your question in a long fashion, yes, they do have uh, a, a, a very substantial part of the buying process and get, gets factored in. Right. And uh, for our facility managers listening out there, um, you know, Gip, Gip brings up a good point here um, that and it probably feels like to a, a lot of facility managers who, who come into this situation and you ask them these questions, it probably feels like, it's like, this guy's just trying to pick me apart. You know, I don't know why he's doing this. And there's probably some frustration there. But at the end of the day, it's, it's because you want what is best. And so when you come into those scenarios and you know that you're going to get those kinds of questions, um, you really need to be able to articulate that value. So um, great advice there, Gip. And, um, you know, one of the things that I want to kind of close with, this is a two-sided question here, um, are, are mistakes. Um, so on the buyer side, um, I'm sure there have been one or two not so great vendors over the last 36 years that you've uh, employed. Um, what are some of the mistakes or lessons maybe you've learned along the way um, when you're evaluating vendors? I think the biggest mistake we can probably all agree on is, is just making too many assumptions. And just because a roofing company 
is in the roofing industry doesn't make them a roofing expert, a roofing professional, certified in roofing, licensed roofer, insured as a roofer, or competent as a roofer, nor does that make them uh, timely or responsible or communicative or problem solving, nor does it make them a, um, uh, an, an actual value enhancer. All those things, these are just top of mind because I hired a pretty poor roofer back in the 80s and came to, to look at the progress that they were making in the middle of the rain and they were applying uh, a, a built up roof in a rainstorm and I'm like, I'm not sure that that's actually a good idea. And you no, know, that, that's actually horrible. You just you don't put tar in, in wet surfaces. So I was young and, and I learned and they were fly by night and they, uh, like many, many um, unscrupulous folks were in and out of the business for, for the quick buck. Um, yeah, they did a roof job, but it wasn't the roof job that I assumed it would be. So I think making assumptions, uh, just too many assumptions is, is the first and foremost, most critical mistake uh, that you can make. Um, have your questions, um, manage expectations, ask the right questions of them and see what kind of answers you get. Because when you ask um, highly intelligent, um, highly thoughtful questions that paint a picture of a particular expectation and your service partner can't take you from point A all the way to point B at the end of the project and meet that expectation vision that you've created, then, then they're not for you. So there is something that was missed along the way. So I would say assumptions would be, assumptions and presumptions would be the biggest culprit in that scenario. Yeah, and you want to give, you know, I, I want to give the the property managers out there the benefit of the doubt in a lot of those scenarios where um, it's not the only thing that they're working on. You know, it's not like, oh, I have to evaluate this roofer and that's all I got, all I've got going on this week. Um, you know, the, I, I understand, you know, out, you know, you facility and property managers out there, you're busy, busy people. Um, and at times you're just like, okay, look, yeah, we got to make a choice. Let's just go here. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's good advice though. Um, never make assumptions and, you know, you have to realize the importance of those individual service partners and, and what they're going to bring to your facility. So, um, I, I mentioned that was a double sided question. So the other side of that question is what would you believe, what do you believe to be the, the single most damaging sales tactic used by prospective service partners? Yeah, I mentioned it before. I think, um, um, you know, my study of, of values is, has uncovered uh, what, what you might think would be fairly obvious, uh, obvious discoveries. And that is, that is, it's taking the assumptions a, a step further. Um, service partners, and they could be some very, very good ones, have assigned people um, with a task of generating sales um, without, without uh, developing relationships and relationships will never be developed without needs in the conversation and discussion and some type of a, um, some type of a rapport uh, that, that's built that gives me comfort that I can go to the next, to the next level. But it's, it's the shotgun approach of pleading for my time that uh, not only lets them appear desperate, but um, it just devalues them in such a significant way right out of the gate that they are assuming I, I'm so busy that there is no freaking way that I would have more than five minutes to give to them <laughs> to listen to that thought. Yeah, you just said it yourself. We're, we're busy. It's not the only thing that we're working on, but please, please, please do not sell yourself short right out of the gate. Allow us to, to dictate the pace and the amount of time invested in this discovery because I'm learning as much about you as you are hopefully trying to discover from me. But um, yeah, I think that's the, 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 the one that, that really pains me the most is to see Otherwise, good companies come right out of the block with a, um, uh, a very undervalued uh, position. And, and it, it 
goes into, I, I don't put it in the trash. I save all these emails, all these cold emails into a cold email folder that I will respond to. And, and, and my response is, I would love to give you business, but I'm not going to, at least not now. And then I go off into, if there are different ways you can do things, here's, here's a few suggestions. So I do have kind of like my cold e email response all set up. Um, but, um, you know, cause I don't want to just slam anybody and ignore, ignore anybody because I think it's, you know, sales are what make the world go around. Um, I, I'm really loving getting into the sales process, the sales conversations, both sides of the party. How can we create a win-win, but it extends beyond just the seller and the buyer. It goes to how we win for the companies we represent, how we win for the tenants that we serve, how we win for the clients that we serve, you know, who's the client's client. And when you can get to that, that uh, concentric circle as a service partner, and you know that you've influenced that particular message, then you know you just hit it out of the park. Don't rest on your laurels. Keep investing in that particular relationship because over time and over 36 years, I've got many, many close service partners who have earned my business and um, continue to get uh, more and more business because of that relationship. And so um, do your homework and it'll pay big benefits in the long run. A wise man once told me get that uh, making sales and getting new projects is a, a combination of timing and relationships. Uh, from a timing perspective, I can't sell you a moving truck if you're not moving. And from a relationship standpoint, really everything you just talked about over the last half an hour or so. Um, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I can't thank you enough, really. I think uh, this is one of those rare conversations where service partners and uh, building operators uh, get a, a lot of benefit. Um, so, yep, I, I greatly appreciate uh, your time here today and uh, really uh, would love to keep this conversation going longer, but uh, we're running into our time here. Uh, anything uh, to close out with here? I would just say, um, yes, I think that, that, you know, any investment your service partners uh, your service partner audience makes is uh, really should be into how best to understand the other side. And that's whether it's a business, whether it's a personal relationship, um, whether it's company to company and B2B, um, understanding what drives the other side is gonna allow you to articulate in that language, things that will resonate with that other party. And so when that dance of words can actually be exchanged and it's not 168 hours versus 65 cents per square foot, I mean, that's apples and Rolls Royces, you know, when you're talking the same language, then all of a sudden that language and the conversation can be elevated. So um, that deepens the relationship, that strengthens the bond, that strengthens the, the reliance. And when, when your customer takes as, much or greater of an interest in your company, uh, then you know you've got something uh, worth investing more time into. Great advice from Gip Erskine. Uh, Gip, thank you again. And uh, we uh, look forward to having you all at our next podcast. I'm Scott Holstein with the Building Technology Podcast, signing off. <laughs>